If you got your Bibles this morning, we should be in Daniel chapter 10. We're going to get back into our study on the end times. And uh, we're up to this final uh, section of the book of Daniel. Uh, Dan Daniel chapters 10, 11, and 12 are all connected together. They, so we're going to study them together the way that Daniel wrote them. So let's have a word of prayer and we will get started here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and thank you for loving us. Father God, I thank you so much for this book of Daniel. Lord, your, your whole Bible is great. Your whole Bible is important. But Father, right now, we're focused in Daniel. We're, we're studying this book of Daniel to see the end times, Lord, to see what's coming so that we better understand where we are at today as a, as a people and as a nation. And so, Father, I pray as we come to this, this last section of the book of Daniel, Lord, that you would really open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. This is, this is one of the most important uh, passages in the book of Daniel. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me, Lord, that, that you would give me everything that you would have me to say. And, Father, that you would open all of our hearts, all of our minds, Lord, open our understanding where we can see what you have for us here. And Lord, help us to be careful, Lord. Be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory that you so richly deserve. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel chapter 10, this is Daniel's fourth and final vision. So I, I want to start out, and we're just going to kind of go through it verse by verse. I'll read a verse, and we'll talk about the verse. So we'll probably start in verse 1, which says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So the time is the third year of the reign of Cyrus, king of Persia. So I want us to go back in our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles 36 at the very end of it there, and then at Ezra chapter 1, the very beginning. So if you find Ezra 1, go back a page and you'll find uh, 2 Chronicles 36. I want to look at verses 22 and 23. 2 Chronicles 36, 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Now understand something. If you had a Jewish Bible, that would be the very last page of your Bible. That would be the last thing as a Jew that you would read. Go back. Go back to Jerusalem. All right. Ezra chapter 1. We'll look at the first three verses. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? So this is two years. The Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1 is two years after 
that decree from Cyrus the king of Persia. It was the proclamation to return to Jerusalem and build the temple. So the, the context or the, the, uh, the theme, I guess you would say, of these last three chapters of Daniel is also found here in verse 1, where it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing was true. Now look at this. But the time appointed was long. So we, we kind of see the tone set here. The, the things that we're talking about are something that's going to happen in the future. If you look at verse 14 of chapter 10, it says, Now I am come to make thee understand. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. He says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. So we see that this is, a, this is a vision and a prophecy of something that will actually happen many hundreds of years later. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 44. Keep your place in Daniel. We'll be back. Isaiah chapter 44. Verse 28. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Now look at 45 verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the Persian Empire taking over the Babylonian Empire and how that they went in through the, through the dried up river. If we would have went back a little further, we would have seen that God said He was going to do that also. And they walked into Babylon and opened the two-leaf gates. And the Persian army just walked into Babylon and, and overthrew it. So that is a prophecy. Here's, here's why I put that in where I put it in now. Because that prophecy was made at least 150 years before the event. The prophecy was made and God was naming Cyrus was the guy that was going to do it and he hadn't even been born yet. That's why the great scholarly minds of the world all say that the book of Isaiah as the book of Daniel was written at a, by somebody else at a much later time. Come on. God knows yesterday from today and tomorrow. God knows everything in the past and everything in the future. Amen. All we have to do is believe. So don't buy that lie. So Daniel chapter 10 is the introduction to the last quarter of the book of Daniel. And as I said in the beginning, we're going to study these three chapters and, and for, as a single unit. Uh, because that's the way they're written. If you're going to understand it, that's the way it has to be studied. So that's what we're going to do. So Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. I'll start in verse 2 because we've read verse 1 already. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekal. Let's stop right there. We'll finish up here in a minute. 
So in, in, these, in this little passage here, this verses 1 to 4, we see the burden of Daniel's heart. The time is 536 B.C. As I said, it's two years after the decree to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Daniel is around 90 years of age. It's two years after King Cyrus issued the proclamation for the Jews to return to their land and to restore the temple. Zerubbabel led the return to the land and only 42,360 Jews went with him. This is bothering Daniel. So we're in the first month of the, of the Jewish calendar, Nisan, or it would be our April. And this prayer and this vision took place during the time of the Jewish Passover. And the location, as we said, was the great river, river Hedekal, which is now called the Tigris. And if you go back, <clears throat> I'm not going to take the time for it this morning, but you can write this down, Genesis 2 and 14. It says that it was one of the rivers that flows uh, out of the Garden of Eden and was the eastern border of the Garden of Eden. So that's where Daniel's located at. And the theme is established. It's for a time that was appointed a long time down the road. So let's look at verse 2 where it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Daniel is sad. He's in mourning. As, as people are in mourning when somebody dies. And you go, wow, okay. He must have been having a hard time. Yeah. Daniel is heavily burdened. Daniel had been in Babylon for about 72 years at this time. Somewhere around 72, 73 years. Remember, he was 17 or 18 when he was taken captive. So now he's about 90 years old. He had spent his youth in the promised land and his life longing to return. When you go through the book of Daniel, you see that's a, that's a central thing in Daniel's heart, his, his, his home, his land, Jerusalem. He was of the line of the princes of Judah. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah. He was much younger, but quite possibly a personal acquaintance. One thing for sure, he read his writings because he knew what was going on. He had read Jeremiah's writings. He had witnessed the proclamation of Cyrus. He was also a witness to the fact that only 42,360 Jews had obeyed God and went back to the land. Now you say, why are you making such a big deal about that number? Because it was such a minuscule part of the number of people that was actually in Babylon. They had been there for 70 years having children. There was millions of them there. And only a few had cared enough to return to the land that God had given them. They, listen, they had grown comfortable in their captivity. Amen. Folks, there are a lot of believers today that have grown too comfortable in this world to desire all that God has for us. Amen. It's just too easy here. We want it, but we won't, don't want to give up our comfort in Babylon, which becomes our captivity. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. The things of the world. Remember all the way back in, in Daniel chapter 1 when he was taken captive and they wanted to give him the king's dainties? Have you listened to any politicians on the TV lately? 
They want to give you everything. Why? Because they want you to be their captive. Don't buy it. Daniel didn't. Daniel chapter 10 verse 2 says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Daniel spent three full weeks on his face before God. We see again, we talked about this a lot last week, we see again Daniel humbling himself and denying his flesh in order to hear from God clearly because of the burden of his heart. I got carried away with that last week. And you know, I had a terrible time last week. Because I would start my little flimsy prayers. And I would remember my message <laughs> that God had given me last, last Sunday. And by the way, if you looked at my notes from last Sunday, that wasn't the message that was in my notes from last Sunday. That was the message from God last Sunday. Amen. And He worked on me with it all week. So if you think I was picking on you, that wasn't the way it was rolling out. <laughs> was not the way it was rolling out. We need to understand this. Daniel is an old man. He is not ever going back to his homeland and yet he is burdened because of those who are able to return aren't burdened to do so. Well, think about that, folks. We have our salvation. We have our guarantee that we are going to our homeland. We're going. But what about those people who don't know Jesus Christ? Do we have a burden like Daniel? When we look at this thing doctrinally, we see the same thing happening now. And I'm talking doctrinally now. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking doctrinally. This is to the Jew. World War I got the land ready for the Jews. World War II got the Jew ready for the land. But today, there are millions and millions of Jews in other parts of the world that have no desire to be obedient to the Word of God and go back to Jerusalem. Amen. Why is that? Because they're comfortable in their captivity. I was thinking about this this morning as I was studying and praying this morning, and I thought, you know what? I was watching the news the other night, and there's thousands of Jews in New York City that are being persecuted. They're being locked out of their synagogues. They're being unable to meet for deaths in the family or weddings in the families. And they still won't get on a plane and go back to Jerusalem. It hasn't got bad enough yet. That's the beginning, my friends. The beginning of what's coming. If we look at it inspirationally, we find the same not caring attitude in Christians today. We want just enough God to stay out of hell, but not enough God to give up our comfort zone right here in the good old U.S. of A. Just not quite ready to do that. Are we? Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 9. Now, if you have any question about who wrote the book of Daniel, I'll just refer you back to verse 2. 
where it says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. So if you've been reading your study Bible and it says, well, you know, we don't know for sure if Daniel wrote Daniel. Daniel knew for sure that Daniel was writing Daniel, okay? So let's go to verse 5. Then I lift up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Folks, Daniel just had an encounter with the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Oh yes, he did. The rest of chapter 10 from this point deals with Daniel's encounters with extraterrestrials as we call them today, with other angelic beings. But this little passage right here is Daniel and the man that we know is Jesus before he was Jesus. See, he has always been. He has always been. The birth in Bethlehem was him taking on his humanity. But Jesus has always been. Look in your Bibles. Keep Daniel and Mark there. But go to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. First four verses. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You know what? That light is still shining in darkness, and the darkness still comprehends it not. I think we mentioned that Thursday night. Look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus has always been. Look in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 12. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Wonder what that light is. Maybe go back to the Gospel of John chapter 1 and find out, right? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, 
even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So in Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 9, Daniel has an encounter with Jesus before he was the man. The pre-incarnate Jesus, if you will. Now, before we go back there, I want us to take a little time and compare Scripture with Scripture and see what Daniel describes compared with what John describes for us in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Revelation chapter 1. Some of you tried to get ahead of me and go back to Daniel, didn't you? <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. See, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 through 14, that we learn the Bible by comparing spiritual... No, that's, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. By comparing precept upon precept and line upon line, here a little and there a little. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. Let's go back to 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass, as it burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. We'll see this thing in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 13 through 28. Verse 13 says, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning now as, as I beheld the living creatures behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures was his four faces the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of barrel and they had four and that they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went up, and their four sides, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went thither, was their spirit to go. 
when thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When they went, these went, and when those went, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was like the color of terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other, and one had two which covered on this side, and the other one had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters, and the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings, and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone and the likeness and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire around about within from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness round about this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord and I saw it and I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake and when you compare that with Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 9, you get the true understanding of what Daniel saw. He saw God. And he spoke to him. Look at verse 9. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Basically the same thing that Ezekiel said happened to him when he heard the voice. It fell on his face. Daniel chapter 10 is, in my estimation, the greatest chapter in the Bible to show us spiritual warfare in progress. It's one of the reasons that it has been so confused and misinterpreted and abused over the centuries. This chapter reveals for us what is really going on in the heavens or what we often refer to as outer space, the second heaven. What's going on out there? Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20 we don't have to go there you, you're familiar with it you've read it if you're not go read it when you get home I'm not going to take the time for it today but Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20 tells us how to prepare for the war Daniel chapter 10 shows us the war In verses 10 through 21, Daniel has encounters with at least one and possibly four angelic beings. <clears throat> it's not exactly clear to me. I've read it I don't know how many times and I still can't come up with a for sure answer for that. Some people say there's four. I really see only one, but I can see how you could come up with four. Here's the thing, it doesn't matter. If it's one or four, what Daniel is teaching us here is the same either way. It doesn't, it doesn't change the doctrinal teaching of it. So I wouldn't get in a debate with somebody and waste my time unless they tried to include Jesus in with it and then we have a problem. All right? 
<clears throat> we'll talk about those verses later on. But I want to look at verse 9. When Daniel hears the words of the Lord, it knocks him out. Or, you know, we might say he fainted or he passed out or, you know, it blew him away. Something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> the thing was, he was out and his face was in the dirt like Ezekiel. The point that is being made is that hearing what he heard was more than he could take. It overwhelmed him. Back in Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. <clears throat> the accompanying angelic being, not Jesus, lifts Daniel up. You say, well, why do you say that? Because I read ahead. Verse 13 says, <clears throat> the, same, the same angel is speaking. He says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. <clears throat> Listen. Jesus, past, present, and future, is detained by nobody or no thing. Gabriel was. See, I don't believe that Jesus could be hindered by anybody or anything, including the angelic forces in the second heaven, Daniel, or me, or you. Jesus is going to fulfill his mission, and nobody's going to stop him. You ever wonder why when he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the people were shouting, Hosanna to the king, they wanted to make him the king, and he said no. You ever wonder why? I mean, that's what he came for, right? No. He came for you and me. He came to redeem the lost world. Those same people that were shouting Hosanna on Sunday was shouting crucify him on Wednesday. I believe they were sent by Satan on Sunday just like they was on Wednesday. Now I fulfilled scripture, I understand. But Jesus will allow nothing to hinder him accomplishing his mission. In verses 7 and 8 of Daniel chapter 10, <clears throat> Daniel says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. He goes on in verse 9 and it says, Yet I heard the voice, but the men that were with him didn't hear it. <clears throat> so I want to look at this for a minute. I think there's three things here that I want us to see. Number one, this was an event taking place publicly. It's important that you understand that. This was not something 
that was in Daniel's head. It was a public event. The second thing that we need to see <clears throat> is you can be very close to divine revelation and never see it. Let me tell you something, folks. And I know this to be true because I prove it all the time. How many times have you read a passage of Scripture in the Bible and God show you a little something in it? And you come back two hours later and you read it again and your head goes, how did I miss that before? You missed a divine revelation that was right there in front of you. Happens all the time. Number three, you can be very close to the words of God and never hear them. The men that were with Daniel got scared and fled and hid themselves. Turn with me real quick to Acts chapter 9. Look at verses 3 through 7. Now Paul's on his, on his, Saul as he was at the time, was on his way to Damascus to persecute some Christians there. Verse 3 says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Look at verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. They saw the light. They heard a noise. They didn't understand anything was happening. I've been in church where the, the salvation message was preached with power and authority. And I've sat beside lost people. And I've seen the struggle. And seen lost people get saved. I was one night at a Bible study and there was a lady sitting beside me and I mean it was like a war going on with that girl. And finally she kicked that chair back and stood up and accepted Jesus Christ as her own. Guy sitting right beside her on the other side that was just as lost as she was never flinched. Same thing. Heard the noise. Saw the light. Didn't respond. It didn't soak in. Didn't understand anything that just happened. Some people get transformed and someone else right beside them will never know, never understand what really happened. This shows us, folks, that there are basically two types of people those who are in touch with God and those who don't have a clue even though they were right there when the thing was revealed. Where the light is the brightest, the danger is the greatest. My old church, there was a lady that I served with in ministry for a number of years there. In the people ministry, which was where we dealt with 
unsaved people to lead them to Christ. Was in the ministry with this young lady for years. And one Sunday she went forward and got saved. You could have knocked me over with a feather. And her testimony was this. I grew up in this church. I always thought I was saved. She had taken people through discipleship. She had done everything that a Christian can do. Except, except Jesus Christ as her Savior. Where the light is the brightest, the danger is the greatest. Amen. Never forget that. Never forget that. You can be very close to God and still never see Him and never hear Him and not know the difference. We're going to stop right here. And we'll pick it up right where we left off next week.